Welcome to everyone joining us for the first ECR Wednesday webinar of 2018, hosted by eLife, the series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. My name's Emma, I work for the eLife Features team, and today our speakers will be discussing how they balance their careers as clinicians with scientific research. The webinar will begin with the panellists sharing their stories. Then, in the second half of the webinar, we'll be putting your questions to them. To ask a question, you can type in the question box on the GoToWebinar functions panel, or you can tweet us, we are at Eli Community, using the ECR Wednesday hashtag. Please also join us on Twitter immediately after the webinar, where we'll be continuing the discussion under the ECR Wednesday hashtag. Today's chat will be moderated by Vino from the eLife Early Career Advisory Group. Finally, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording the webinar and will make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now I'll pass over to Margarita to introduce the panelists. Hello, um, welcome to our um, webinar. I just need to mention that eLife, I wanted to sell, is a non-profit journal and it's aimed at improving the way science is performed and communicated. Um, it's committed to support early career researchers, like me, and uh, through different initiatives. And I am a member of this early career advisor group. Um, I would like to talk in this webinar about uh, how medics can be researchers as well. So we would like to discuss the different career paths that exist to allow clinicians to be scientists. So we know that working clinicians who have a career in research are ideally positioned to identify medical relevant questions for scientific research. Uh, but the career path is, although it's becoming increasingly popular, it can often be long and challenging. Uh, so in this webinar, we would like to discuss the different training routes that exist around the world to facilitate this career path and how to balance uh, the demands of juggling clinical practice with scientific research. So we have three speakers today. One is Claudia Sommer, who is a professor of neurology and runs a peripheral, nerve, um, a peripheral neurology lab. Then we have uh, David Bennett, who is a professor of neurology and neurobiology and a consultant neurologist at Oxford University. Um, and we have Clifford Rosen from, sorry, Claudia is from Germany. Dave is uh, from um, uh, the UK. And Clifford Rosen, who is from the USA, who is the director of the Center for Clinical and Translational Research at uh, Maine Medical Center. Uh, and our speakers are going to talk a little bit about their experience and how the different uh, career paths exist in the different countries. Mm -hmm. So first is Claudia going to tell us about her experience. Yes, Claudia. Thank you, Margarita, for the invitation and for the introduction. And I'm very happy to talk about this subject because uh, it's very important to me. I have always wanted to be a medical researcher. In fact, I started studying medicine to be a medical researcher. This has always been my motivation. And one thing I wanted to tell you, the, the new generation, is that things nowadays are much, much better than they were <laughs> then. Um, because we had 12 hour shifts and night shifts and never a day off. And then to do research was really difficult. So I had to find my own research time, which I found after doing a psychiatry residency, which I found in a neuropathology lab with a stipend um, for two years. And then after doing my uh, neurology residency uh, in an experimental pain laboratory in San Diego in the US. And this is possible, and I came back to my home university, built up my lab. The environment was supportive, but not so supportive. So I changed university, went to the next place, and here I am still. So this was successful in the end, and the lab has grown and has given rise to several young researchers who already have their own labs. Um, nowadays, um, we have found that um, it's not possible to do research like this anymore because the fields, all the fields, not only neurology, have become a lot more competitive. Um, so um, we also need better programs to help uh, young doctors to do 
research. And I just wanted to give you some examples for, from Germany where I think there are some quite good programs. For example, the medical school in Mannheim has uh, already for several years um, a program for the medical students where you can rather early choose if you want a more clinical path, a more clinical scientist path or a more health economic path. And in parallel to doing your medical school, you can follow master courses in the different subjects, for example, health economics or biomedical engineering, if you are engaged in that way. And another example, the medical school in Cologne, um, they offer a research track that the medical students can uh, enter from the beginning if they know I want to be a clinician scientist. Uh, similar in the medical school in Munich. So what did my medical school here in Würzburg do? We, first of all, we established a mentoring program. I think this is very important. There is mentoring by experienced clinician scientists, but also by the peers. So those people who uh, are engaged and who want to be clinician scientists, they see that they're not alone, that they have peers with the same ambitions and maybe similar problems. Um, then um, we established also several courses to become a master of science in parallel with medical school, which is ambitious, but can be done. And uh, it's now been changed uh, and put into one course, which is called translational medicine. But within this master course, the students can take several branches, for example, a more experimental science oriented or a more epidemiolo epidemiology oriented um, plan. Um, one uh, particular thing to understand the system in my country is that the, the MD thesis, the doctoral thesis, has always had a great value. And it is, in our country, uh, it has the same value as a PhD thesis. So uh, when you had your MD doctorate, you did not have to do a PhD in addition because you already had done several years of research work in parallel to your studies. You were in a team, um, you learned how to do research, you wrote a thesis, so this was great. But given that internationally um, this is not so well understood and sometimes a PhD, an official PhD is needed for a career, this has also changed and first of all we have more structured MD thesis programs, which are also more ambitious. And we have MD PhD programs where very ambitious students can do both in a certain time with uh, respective uh, tutoring. Um, right, and um, just after graduation from medical school, there are also several programs that have been started and one is, uh, it's actually called the Clinician Scientist Program. And this is a program where uh, the young doctors go into their specialty, or the specialty they want to do, whether it's pediatrics or orthopedics or whatever, but with certain research times. So one year clinical, one year research and so on, until they have fulfilled a certain program and done a certain research and at the same time, uh, are licensed for their specialty. So this has recently started and uh, um, I think it's a very good thing to uh, give the young researchers really protected research time. Uh, so this is the, the biggest of the programs and there are several smaller ones like the first lab rotation program where they get half a year of protected time or uh, the first grant program where they can compete for an internal grant and have their, their first own research project. Um, my medical school is just one example uh, and there is this development, luckily, I think, um, in, in many medical schools to um, 
they have seen that there is this need that a clinician scientist cannot do everything by themselves, um, that we need structures programs and they are there now. So I think today is um, a very good time for anybody to start in these programs. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. That's what, that was very interesting. Um, I think the next speaker will be Dave. If you can please provide us your experience and what different career paths exist in the UK. Sure. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I echo Claudia's comments. This is uh, a, an issue that's dear to my heart. So I thought what I would do is um, I'll speak a little bit about my own experience. And um, again, echoing Claudia's comments, I think training has changed in the UK quite a lot uh, since my time. But then I'll bring you a little bit up to date on the kind of things that are offered uh, in the UK now. So uh, like a lot of things, actually, my experience was somewhat uh, driven by chance. So I did, um, like a number of medical students in the UK, I did a one year uh, BSc at what was then St. Thomas's Hospital. And that BSc was in neuroscience. And the um, really the issue of chance was that I happened to work in the lab of someone that became a very good friend and mentor, and that's Steve McMahon. And in fact, there was more chance than that because he was meant to be going to do a research project in uh, in San Francisco and his uh, wife became pregnant and he couldn't go. Uh, and so that summer uh, I went in his place uh, to run this project and had a great time. Uh, and so I did a kind of two month research project in the US instead of going on a summer holiday and came back and decided that I really love research. And at the same time as that happened, the medical school decided to set up um, what they termed an MB PhD, which in the US would be called an MD PhD. And they said to me, uh, do you want to do an MD PhD um, and we'll pay for it? And I thought, well, I've just had a great time in San Francisco. This sounds like a, uh, I'm really enjoying the research. So I said, yes. Um, so this is not something that kind of I'd set out at the beginning of my medical career as uh, what I was going to do, it, that these chance things had happened. Uh, and that really set me on my career in the sense that I had a, a very enjoyable uh, PhD, spending some time in the UK and some time at Genetech San Francisco. Um, and I got a great training in uh, basic neuroscience. And so I did all of that PhD prior to uh, completing my medical degree. And certainly one thing that, one question I often get from people um, still now is when should they, when's the best time to do a higher degree uh, like a PhD? Uh, and I think there's no easy answer to that. I think. Uh, actually, um, there are pros and cons. So one of the disadvantages of doing an MD PhD uh, is you're quite junior in medicine. You might not know exactly what specialty uh, you want to do. So you know, ha had I done a, a PhD in neuroscience and then decided actually what I really wanted to be was a cardiologist, uh, potentially that have, could have caused some issues. Although I would say that there's a lot of generic techniques in science in general and actually having a good scientific training can cross uh, some of these different specialties. Uh, but some people use that as a reason as preferring to wait to do their PhD until they've at least started uh, their specialist training. I think what I would say is if you have a great opportunity to work in a wonderful lab um, and that lab is very productive and you think you can do great research there, then that probably is one of the best reasons uh, to do a PhD. Uh, so one of the disadvantages I had, uh, again, was not, not dissimilar to what Claudia was saying, uh, was that I then went back into medicine. And in fact, in my time, there was no scheme for combining uh, research and medical training. So I went then back into full-time medicine for seven years and I was trying to write papers and exactly as Claudia was saying, I was my elective was spent doing research, uh, every spare moment was spent in the lab, but none of this was actually uh, meant to be spent on research time. Uh, and then I, I guess I had another uh, stroke of luck. I, when it got to the point where I could apply for some more research funding, um, I kind of actually wrote a grant with uh, very little provisional data, um, but I had an idea and, and uh, it, it was um, going to be partly working again in the same uh, in the same department as I'd done my PhD, which is a very supportive department. Uh, and I got that grant from the Wellcome Trust, which is a charitable foundation in the UK, and that really set me uh, on my course uh, for the future. So kind of how have things changed and you know, what improvements have happened in the UK? I think one, one major thing that is a definite improvement is that there are now specific academic training programs for medics that want to combine research and medicine. And, and so even at the level of kind of the most 
junior medical doctor, which would in in our uh, in the UK would be a foundation doctor, uh, and then really at tiered levels up from that, uh, you can apply for special academic training programs where there is some uh, dedicated research time uh, that can be combined with your medical training, and that's a, I think a really excellent uh, advance. Um, the route now that many people take is they will, they will, if they want to do academic medicine, they will enter one of those academic programs. They will use some of that dedicated time uh, uh, to start making links with a lab, which obviously there's a there's a commonality between the interests of the lab and their and their medical specialist training, whatever that may be, to start generating some data, some provisional data, and then apply. Uh, for what in the UK we'd call a, a training fellowship and that that might be to do a PhD if they haven't yet done a PhD or it might be at a higher level of that what we would call an intermediate fellow where now they're just beginning to start um, their own independent lab again usually with some kind of uh, a mentor or supervisor uh, but they might be beginning to set up their own uh, research program. And so that integration has happened across the UK between working between their national health service and the university sectors. And in general, I would say it's an excellent thing. It's important that people choose the right environment to be in. Uh, and so they're going to want to think about you know, wh where there is a good track record in the, both the clinical specialty and research they're interested in. And again, um, we, we now have mentoring programs. So in my department, all the clinical academics have, have a mentor. In fact, what, almost virtually whatever level of uh, seniority uh, that they are in. It's true that grant writing is still very important because at one stage there's a hurdle and that is to get a grant to undertake a uh, clinical fellowship. And again, we try and mentor people uh, through that process. Uh, and I would say kind of w once you, you've got that grant, then there's the challenges of setting up your own independent research program. And, and, a, and I would say that things that can be very helpful is if you're in a, in a supportive environment to collaborate, uh, to have access to shared equipment is ext ex also extremely helpful and also the more generic uh, kind of professional training in, in leadership uh, and management that, that needs to take place as well. So that's, that's really a summary of what's happening in the UK at the moment and obviously I'm happy to take any questions later. Thank you. Thank you David, it was uh, yeah, very interesting as well and it's, I'm glad to see that there are changes in most countries at least. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's quite an event. Clifford, please, can you give us a, your experience and your yeah. tips? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for tuning in. So I had a very different experience too, and I sort of echo both Claudia and David. So uh, I finished medical school in 1971. I was a biochemistry major and worked in the lab and wanted to do medical research, but realized at the time of choosing between a PhD and an MD, which was a very difficult choice for me. My mom pushed me into becoming a doctor. So I went to medical school instead, but with that uh, deep interest in research. And I did some work in a lab my first year, but got overwhelmed with medical school and ended up uh, getting interested in clinical medicine. And uh, it was an interesting time because there were many, many changes, uh, but the basic molecular and cellular biology advances really began to occur just after uh, I finished my training. And um, so uh, although I had an interest, I was really worried about how I would get back into the process, particularly with the, the very rapid advances that were occurring. So I ended up going through medicine, uh, did a residency and a chief residency, and then um, practiced general medicine for three years out in the rural area of northern Maine. Uh, and decided very quickly after that that I wanted to do research. And I applied and got an endocrine fellowship in endocrinology so I could both practice endocrine and potentially set up a lab. And uh, I did that, went through my fellowship, did my uh, research training, came back to Maine to set up a lab and to uh, to practice endocrinology. And that's where the uh, dynamic between practicing and doing research becomes very, very uh, tenuous. And uh, the early years were really um, pretty much what David said and Claudia to some extent as well, is that we were trying to practice clinical medicine at the same time that we're um, trying to uh, set up a research lab and trying to write grants and trying to publish papers, primarily in clinical medicine with uh, outreach to back, going back to basic. 
And it really wasn't until I had a PhD student who uh, who subsequently uh, trained under me, who then did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Jackson Lab, who encouraged me to come back to uh, basic science uh, at the Jackson Lab. And so my career actually was in reverse. Instead of starting off doing both basic and clinical, I was doing clinical, and I had to go back and learn, relearn genetics and learn mouse genetics and mouse physiology, and then um, uh, come back to become uh, a uh, a director of a basic uh, laboratory. My interest is in bone biology, and we have a very active uh, bone research laboratory uh, funded by several NIH grants at Maine Medical Center. I still do some translational medicine, and I am uh, I'm involved in clinical trials, and I'm an ed editor at New England Journal of Medicine. So I still have the ca capacity to uh, do clinical medicine, but my uh, primary love is in the lab, and our work is focused on the uh, stem cell fate uh, in the bone marrow of skeletal and fat cells. Uh, the landscape has changed, as David and Claudia said, and it's changed dramatically. And when people ask me about my career uh, path, I try to tell them that this is not the path that I would encourage people to take. Uh, one, to relearn molecular and cellular biology and genetics. Uh, was a, a huge undertaking for me at the same time I was seeing uh, patients. And nowadays, uh, there is a much better option, and that is in the U.S. is the MD-PhD program, of which there are many now, uh, of which there were virtually uh, a handful when I started my training, and so much so that I wasn't even aware that I could do an MD-PhD, let alone know that they would pay for uh, the full seven years or eight years of doing the MD-PhD. Now we have a very strong MD-PhD program at, at most, if not all, the medical schools. Uh, the funding is still there to support the individuals. It's very competitive, but it's a spectacular program. So you start with two years of medical school, and then you go into a lab, uh, and you spend four to five years in a lab to get your PhD, and then you come back and uh, finish your MD degree. And it's a fantastic uh, uh, setup because it provides you with a, the, great, the tremendous uh, opportunity to see what clinical medicine is to begin with, and then go to the lab and then come back and ask the right questions and talk about the things that you now know uh, are, as a critical thinker is important. And, in me and I think for us clinician scientists, the, the concept is that you want, you want bi-directionality. You want to see patients and obviously seeing patients and then going to the lab and testing those, uh, what you see in the lab sounds great. It doesn't happen very often, but it's exciting when you see a mutation and you're able to identify, you know, where the mutation is and what the functional consequences are, but that's pretty unusual. On the other hand, taking your laboratory skills and applying them in clinical medicine is actually very, very exciting. And I'll give you just one brief example. Uh, we ran an NIH-funded clinical trial of a, of a, a, a peptide that uh, was used to treat osteoporotic patients, and we published it in the New England Journal 15 years ago, and it was very exciting, and, every, and it gets lots of citations and still, and uh, it was a big deal. Um, I was still running my basic lab and doing some other work, and it wasn't until about eight or nine years later that I started thinking about that clinical trial that I designed and I was the senior author of and said, wait a minute, you know, there are some unanswered questions at the cellular level about what that, uh, what our findings uh, suggested or supported. So we went back to basic work in understanding the uh, target cell for the anabolic peptide and the metabolism surrounding it. And now we've exposed a whole new area with a lot more uh, funding uh, to look at uh, the metabolism of the bone cell in the bone marrow niche. Um, and it directly came from the original clinical observation and trial, then back to the basic lab to expose some of the areas that we weren't clear about mechanism. And then back to the clinical world, we now have a new clinical grant looking at analyzing uh, biopsies from patients to see if the hypothesis testing that we've uh, produced in our mouse lab really holds up in, in humans. So, 
So it's opened up a whole new avenue of research. And I think that bi-directionality allows the clinician scientist something that um, is really unique uh, uh, versus just a PhD or versus just an MD. So we now in the U.S., besides having the MD-PhD program, we have a lot of NIH funding directed at making that translational uh, capacity more inherent once uh, training is complete. So we have what's called the K, uh, K-23 program funded by all the NIH institutes, which allow mid-career uh, clinicians to uh, do more scientific investigations, and 75% of their salary is committed to going to other labs and uh, learning new, uh, new procedures, uh, but more importantly, understanding some of the basic mechanisms that underlie what they're doing clinically. So there is that uh, K mechanism. And, and on the other side, for the uh, basic scientists, of course, the translational uh, capacity, the ability to take what you see and relate that to clinical medicine now is inherent in anybody who gets funded from NIH. There has to be a translational aspect to that. And nobody is better at doing that than the individuals that have actually done it in the clinic. So I'm frequently approached and say, how can I make my you know, spectacular science translatable? And it's really the clinicians that can help you do it. So, so the clinician scientists really have a unique um, role in, uh, in, in basic and clinical research. So that's my uh, experience. And uh, I think the opportunities are m much greater now. They've expanded dramatically in the United States. Yeah. Thank you very much, Clifford. That was uh, really interesting as well. I think, yeah, we all have very similar uh, experiences. Yeah. We already have two questions. We can get started. So the first one is, um, what will be your advice for those people who are not sure whether or not to pursue a, a research and medical career? Maybe we'll start with Dave, and then the next one could be Clifford. I, mean, I think one one, uh, I mean, certainly in the UK, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how easy uh, I'd be interested in Clifford's experience in the US, but a, a nice kind of taster of whether you're going to enjoy research it is in, in the UK was this thing called a uh, an in, intercalated BSc. It's like a, a one year that you put in the middle of the medical degree. So in all, the, the minimum time for a medical degree in the UK would be two years of preclinical training, which would be your basic kind of anatomy, physiology, biochemistry and then three years of much more clinically orientated work when you're seeing patients and you're on the wards. I have to say there's more integration than there used to be, but that, that's the, the shorter duration is five years. And then quite a few people, in fact, everyone in Oxford, but probably in London, it's less than that. It's more like 50, 60 percent. They put in an, a year in between the, the first two and the last three years. And the idea of that is that's a much more research orientated year. So they go into depth in one subject. It might be neuroscience. It might be uh, cardiovascular medicine. It might be cancer. Uh, and uh, it, the, the standard part of that will be that there'll obviously be standard lectures, but then there will also be some time in a research lab. And I think, to be honest, that kind of thing is extremely helpful because you, you can get a feel for, do I actually like the process of doing science? Do I like uh, the differences that science offers to medicine? I actually think that the, it, it, I love the connectivity between research and medicine, but actually they're quite, in some ways, they're quite different disciplines as to how you spend your day. Uh, and, you know, you, you need to be much more comfortable with um, constant failure in science. Generally in medicine, there's also someone more senior that pretty much always has the answer. In science, you'll often go to your supervisor and they kind of shrug your shoulders and say, well, do it another five times. And when it starts working, we'll talk again. So, so the, the process of doing science and medicine are quite difficult. And I think it's good just to get a taster for some kind of doing a research project and get a feel, do, do I like the process of doing this? And then that's helpful because also it's a, a one-year commitment uh, before you make what would be a much more major commitment of, of kind of doing a either a, a PhD for three years or potentially an MD, um, which, which in the UK is a research degree to prevent any confusion. Um, so, uh, so Claudia, when she was saying, uh, 
uh, was referring to MD. She's talking about the German equivalent of the UK MD, which is where you spend two years doing doing research. But generally in the UK, people do a PhD if there is the higher degree, and that's a three-year project. And of course, that's much more of a commitment. So my answer would be, if you want to get a feel as to whether you enjoy it, you try and get some experience in, in, in a lab in an area that you enjoy. It doesn't even, it doesn't actually have to be a whole one-year uh, research degree. You could, uh, m many medical schools will have programs and they exist here uh, where in, in kind of in the first two years you get quite long summer holidays and you can come and work in a lab for a month or two months and I get people writing to me saying uh, David I just want to get experience what it's like in a lab and, and we pretty much always have one or two medical students that will come to us uh, for four to six weeks and just get a feel for do like to do they like the process of research, and that's what I would recommend. I, I don't know what Clifford feels. I'll be interested to hear what happens in the in the USA. Yeah, so uh, I think it reflects the same thing, David. Actually, so we uh, we get summer students. We have a summer uh, intern program and a full year intern program where people in undergraduate uh, programs can come and spend a couple hours a day three or four days a week, getting a taste of what it's like to be in an active research lab. And then we have a very competitive summer program where they spend four months during the summer, primarily medical students, but also some undergraduates. And they, uh, they, spend, they take a tour of our institute, they select the lab, and then, they're, uh, and then they're chosen based on their academic record and their interests. So one of the uh, confounders that we find is that there's a level of anxiety among uh, physician students or uh, undergraduates uh, in terms of getting in the lab. And, and so the uh, early experience of letting them just get a feel for what it's like and the fact that it's not such a foreign environment, there's collegiality, people help out, um, uh, we ask good questions, uh, nobody's intimidated, uh, you start with a very uh, small project, that might be just reading slides, for example, from a biopsy or doing something else that really doesn't require some of the skill sets that we use uh, among our senior people. Uh, and that helps uh, people get a feel for it and also understand that the black box when you're in clinical medicine, you say, gee, research, it's so hard, there's so many techniques, it's so difficult. Uh, that gets broken down and we try very hard to do that to allow people some comfort level so that they have a feeling for this. One great thing about uh, being a physician is there's tremendous opportunities to do many different things. You can do almost anything. You can teach, you can be an administrator, you can be a researcher, and, um, and each of them requires skill sets. Even being an administrator, you really need to have a specific skill set, although sometimes people don't think that. Uh, to be a researcher, you clearly have to have uh, skill sets, not just in the lab, but the other thing we found is being able to write is extremely important. In fact, I just tell all my postdocs and grad students, if you can't write and if you try, this probably isn't where you want to be because writing is essential for not just for funding, but for organizing your ideas and getting everything together. And so what we teach in, in our lab among the young people is, can you write? If you can't, we can help you. Uh, and learning how to write becomes a huge step in the whole process. So, so I think it's. Uh, I think what David said. It is it, a year, six months, three months. Exposure is really uh, critical. One interesting facet in the states is it's very competitive to get into medical school. So we get a lot of people who don't get into medical school the first year, attempt, and then they come and they want to do a year in the lab. And it's really interesting to see their growth and development because they now are, one, more mature, two, they've developed some critical thinking skills that they might not have developed in undergraduate. And three, they're much more uh, likely to get into medical school after one or two years in a laboratory. And, that, and to me, the critical thinking in a laboratory is what makes for a better clinician. So in, in some ways, it probably should be mandated that everybody spend a year in the lab before they go to medical school. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for those answers. I think we have two more questions, so let's continue. So one is, uh, 
can doing both medical practice and research be detrimental for your career? Would you like to Is that again, Margarita didn't quite hear all of that. Is it yeah, that I didn't again? understand that. Sorry, doing medical practice and research at the same time, can that be detrimental for your career? Can it be bad because you get you don't get on the top of it to career? That's a problem. I'll, I'll start and let David think about it first for a minute. Okay. <laughs> because I think it, it's, it's, it's actually a very insightful question. Um, I think, you know, in my experience, as I was um, growing my lab, and shrinking my clinical responsibilities, there was some concern I had that I was losing my enthusiasm for clinic and gaining it for the lab. And I think you have to appreciate that your experiences with patients require your full undivided attention. And you really have to be able to be able to balance that with the lab. You cannot and this happened to me and I began to realize that I had to confine my um, clinical practice to what I could do, not what I think I could do. And, and that meant that I had to limit the patient exposure a bit while my lab was expanding. And, and I think it's really important to understand what your capabilities are, because if you're seeing patients and you're, and you're trying to build your lab or you've got a busy competitive lab, you don't want to be in a situation where you're thinking when you're seeing patients that I should be in the lab or I should be doing this or I should be doing that. I shouldn't be seeing patients. And, and so I think it's not detrimental and a lot of people do it. And one of the things we just got this big $20 million clinical grant to build infrastructure in Northern New England. And one of the emphasis was how to get more people engaged in research clinicians. And so what we found is clinicians who have been in practice really want to see if they can do research, but they don't have the tools, they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the uh, equipment necessary. And our grant is actually designed to try to help them see if they can transition at least part-time or just, uh, you know, as part of their practice into addressing clinical research questions. And so I think those kind of opportunities exist and I think you can do it, but it requires a fine balance. And I can tell you, I think it takes time to develop that balance. But I'm interested to hear what David has to say. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good question. And I mean, I've kind of discussed this quite a lot with people in the past. And kind of someone put it quite nicely to me, which is that what you should, you should see yourself as a clinical academic is an expert in combining clinical work and science. And you maybe shouldn't set the expectation that you're going to be as good a clinician that's doing clinician clinical work 100% of the time, and you're not going to be as good at basic science as someone that's doing basic science 100% of the time. But where your kind of added value is, is that you're actually bringing those two things together, and that's a specialty and something to be applauded um, in its own right. And I think you need to kind of set your expectations at that level. I, I think also, again, going back to Clifford's point about expectations, is I think there are ways you can manage this that that are helpful and I think undoubtedly one thing that I've tried to do and I think is useful is to make sure that your your clinical work and your research are aligned because if they're aligned then actually the two do feed off each other you see the benefits of that your patients see the benefits of that your research benefits from that everything is in a kind of positive relationship um, so kind of my interest is, is neurology and peripheral neuropathy and most of my clinical work is now focused on peripheral neuropathy and pain which is highly aligned uh, with my research work. I don't think, I, I just know that although I'm as safe at general neurology, I am not as good at general neurology as my colleagues that spend 100% of their time seeing patients and doing general neurology. That I can't set myself that expectation. So, and you know, surgeons have, this is particularly true I think as a challenge for some surgical trainees in particular is, is the, the kind of hand-eye coordination, the skills that you need in surgery is getting enough time doing, doing surgery at the same time uh, as doing the science. And again, I think it's about expectations and probably working in areas where the two are aligned and not trying to do everything. I don't think we can do everything. And I, I don't think it necessarily needs to be detrimental to our career in any ways. And as I said, I think you can see it as we're offering one very specific thing, which is combining uh, these two things. That, that's my view on the issue. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think David's right, uh, Margaret. I just want to add. I think we have a tendency as physicians to think we can do everything, <laughs> and I, I think that really is something that you have to grow and mature and realize that it's not possible. And, and I agree. I think being both a great basic scientist and a basic great clinician very 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 difficult and not part of our it should not be part of our expectations but then in the research career at least we have to be the best to get the grant so i mean yeah. you have to be one of the best i mean our, our added value is that we can uh, we will see opportunities coming from clinical work and translation that other people don't see i mean i purposefully i'm I, you know, the, the areas that I work on are areas that I, I can see the connection with clinical very, very clearly. And, and that's my, that's my added value really, is that I am not going to go into a research area where I know there's a huge number of people that are purely doing preclinical science and try and take them on at their own game. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to set this up as a competition, but I mean, that I think what I try and research on is where I feel I have an advantage in, in that it's kind of preclinical, but it's definitely uh, got a clinical translational element and I can see opportunities. And for instance, I'm getting insight from human genetics and I'm getting those results before uh, many other people. And then I can start making the knockout mouse, but mouse or the knock-in mouse before anyone else. So, so you know, I, I'm working, trying to work on that area. Uh, and, I, and I think you can do excellent. Um, I, I, I don't think that quality of my work suffers, but I'm quite careful about what I work on, that it's, it's areas where I'm going to really have that advantage because it's highly translational. We have a couple more questions, so we better uh, keep on answering. So the next one is, uh, have you worked on translational research projects? If so, what's the mixed background of any help? I think we have talked about that already, but maybe Claudia would like to say something. She's back. Um, Yes, um, great question, and uh, I heard David already giving a very good answer to this, and I can only agree. The patients have led me to questions. So if you see a patient with a rare disease, which is within your area of research, and you just want to find out how this disease works, what's the mechanism behind it, and that also makes you so motivated to go into detail and maybe set up a lab model and so on. And this is translational and I think we are optimally suited for this. Well, yes, sometimes we need help. Um, as the others said, there may be some techniques that a pure basic scientist is better, but we can do collaborations. We can go into good collaborations with them because they need our clinical questions. So I think we're very well set up to do this translational research. Thank you. Shall we move to the next question? I mean, a point that's come up is collaboration is fantastically helpful. I mean, if you're in an environment where both on a clinical level, but also on preclinical science, and you have excellent colleagues, which uh, you, you can have a, a fantastic symbiotic relationship uh, between you that's beneficial to, to everyone and, and not necessarily try, you know, we don't need to try and do everything in house. If you have good collaborations, you're so much more than if you're just trying to do everything yourself. So I completely agree. Collaboration is super helpful. Yeah, I would like to add that, that collaborations are really essential. And, and I should mention that translational science or translational medicine is in the eye of the beholder. And it can range from virtually anything to everything. And uh, we're just doing this new concept of reverse translation where the group at Dartmouth has come up with regional utilization of drugs for looking at different uh, treatment efficacies. And in my case, it's osteoporosis, but they came up with these drug combinations that, that increase their risk of fracture. That's about the highest level of translation. It's right at the level of the economy of, of what we're spending our money on. But then they're asking us to go back and test in the mouse what those combinations do to the mouse so that we can get some basic mechanistic answers to why a combination of, let's say, opioids and uh, proton pump inhibitors have such a profound effect. So, so translation is really everything that you're doing uh, and bringing it back, back to the patient ultimately. So. 
We have another question, and this is for Claudia Sommer. So, Professor Sommer, do you think it is it is justified that the doctor med is seen as an equivalent to a PhD? I know some people do several years of research for their doctor med, but as far as I know, most medical students or graduates do much less, two months for a year. Very, very good question, and um, I don't think it is justified for every German doctor med from the past because there were some really easy way of getting it, like looking at the last 100 appendectomies in your hospital and uh, listing up the complications and doing some statistics, and this was the thesis, things like that. I'm not saying this is not useful to anybody, I'm not saying this should not be done, but maybe it's a smaller research project and not a doctoral thesis, okay? But uh, as in the whole field, there has been a lot of development and the rules are becoming stricter, which is good. Uh, the ambitions are becoming higher and we are in the process of moving to the structured doctoral programs, also for the German MD, which means not only one supervisor, one student, and they do something in their cabinet, but a thesis committee, a structured plan, structured teaching. And uh, I think that in the next years, more of these theses will be um, a PhD equivalent than there are now. There are already some, quite a lot, who are now. I mean, somebody who works for three years in a lab, like in ours, but also in many others, and then um, has two or three publications as an MD, why is this not a PhD equivalent? But I agree, not everybody is like this at the moment. They are reaching for it. They are aiming for it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. Um, there's another question. This is to Professor Bennett. Do you think that someone who graduated at medical school did F1 and then went for an MSc, PhD, six years in total, will be looked upon favor favorably when it comes to specialty training post? Or would you, uh, or the time out of clinical practice will be seen as a disadvantage? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I certainly think, so there is some advantage in, depends where you want to get to in life, I guess. So there is some advantage in having done uh, research when it comes to appointments of training numbers uh, in, into specialty training. I certainly wouldn't think that that is the reason uh, to do a, a PhD. Uh, and actually, if you were to look at the point scoring system, the kind of the extra points you get for doing a PhD, uh, they're not much more than having done a kind of uh, a, a local audit. So. Uh, it's not going to massively increase uh, your chances. Uh, if, if you were to apply for kind of, uh, clearly the reason to do it is if you want to go on an academic track and ultimately combine uh, clinical work uh, with research, that, that would be kind of what I think would be a good reason to do uh, that combined MSc and uh, PhD. I'm a bit confused because did it say, I mean, normally a combined MSc PhD scheme would be a four year program, not six. I'm a bit confused. Does it say six, Margarita? It says six because it says uh, F1 and then MSc and PhD. Six, six years in total. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. So that's taking into the basic uh, clinical training as well. Yeah, so F1. it's not going to do you any harm uh, it, it, in terms of when it comes to appointment specialty training. It will be of some benefit. Uh, I don't think it's the level of benefit that it's the, the reason to do it. Uh, I don't think it's going to count against you, certainly, have, having done that. And, I, and I, I think um, people are not going to say, oh, this person's done a PhD and, and therefore they, they, you know, they haven't had enough patient contact in the, in the last few years. Personally, probably I would say on balance, I would probably do the, um, I think there's a slight balance in terms of getting into the special training and then taking time out to do research because you have a training number and then you can find kind of good research labs within your training region. I think there are some advantages there, but I, I think if you had, for instance, a great chance to do a really good PhD before then, um, I, I think um, 
you, you could do that without any problem and you could still get good training after that time. So I, I guess I've kind of fudged my answer there, partly because I think it really depends, or there is no right or wrong answer to that. I think it really depends on personal circumstances. And if you're unsure, I'd suggest that you kind of speak to people in your training programs locally, because they might give you a bit more helpful advice on that. Thank you, Dave. Um, there's another question that says uh, it's general. So, I mean, it's a bit, can we do an intercalated DSC at the end of the medical school instead of doing it in the middle of the medical school? I don't know if the question is. That might be to me, that all depends on your medical school. So I, I think you, you, yeah. there, is no, there is no kind of UK wide policy on that. Most medical schools that chartered an intercalated BSC is between that first two and the last three years but i know there are other medical schools that have made exceptions to that so so the answer to that is you really need to check um with your local medical school what their their policy is some of them will have some flexibility on that others are less flexible in the us they're very less flexible i mean it's a pretty structured system and the reason is is because they invest very heavily they're all funded by nih money and the structure is such that they don't they will not allow you to to do any flexibility. Mm, that's true. Mm. I think you have answered. Is there any other question in the audience or between the speakers? Because we have time for a last question, I think. Maybe I have a, it's not a question, but um, I think one problem that you have when you are doing your medical training and then you go into your specialty training and if you take time off to do research or the other way around, if you are doing research and you go back into your specialty training, then you will have at least three or four years of specialty training where you're not going to be able to be doing much research. And then there's a problem because then when you want to apply for new grants, um, you won't have, you won't get into the grants because you won't have much publications in the last three years. So there's always that difficulty between having to balance the two of them and being able to publish. So you're, uh, you can get the grants and you can get your career going, but also trying to do your specialty training at the same time and trying to um, get time to do it because it, it takes time to learn and to practice and to get all the experience. So I don't know. No, um, in the UK, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Uh, in the UK, that's improved because now there there are a kind of special posts which are designed to coordinate both training in clinical and training in research, and and um, you you have to apply for those posts. Uh, and so, for instance, in this department, we have a number of what's called lectureship posts, uh, and that en enables exactly that that you will get certain blocks, usually three month blocks of research within the year, and then the rest of your time will be uh, spent doing clinical training. You have to accept the fact that overall the training is going to be extended a bit. But I think that's just an excellent idea to keep the kind of research live. It gives you enough time um, to kind of write up some, write some of those grants, to write up some of those papers. Um, so I, I think that, that those are the best kind of jobs to apply for if you want to combine the two because it makes it much easier. Sorry Clifford, I interrupted you. Over to you. Yeah, so in the U.S., um, uh, generally the fellowships are designed so that the first two years of the fellowship are clinically oriented, and then the last several years are research-based. And often what you'll have is a, a fellow who gets into the lab and enjoys it and uh, writes a, uh, a training grant or, or at least uh, gets put on a training grant, and he's or she is allowed to stay on for multiple time periods. Uh, uh, as the funding permits so that their research uh, builds up and the publications build up and then they're able to uh, submit independent uh, grants. Yeah. Um, we have, no, that's the last question. So I think it's time to wrap yeah. up. Uh, well, first of all, thank you everyone for being here and for all the conversation. I think it was very interesting. And uh, I think just a few things that are important and have been improved in the last years is that uh, in many countries there are now um, programs that allowed clinical training uh, at the same time as uh, research or, or scientific uh, training. So I think that's, that's very useful. 
Uh, also, I think it's important what you say about uh, setting up collaboration. So we cannot do everything. So we cannot be the best in the lab, the best in the in the clinic. So it's good to have people that can help us in the lab or can help us in the clinic or, or have uh, good color, uh, collaborations. And I think the other thing is that there is no answer to when is the right time to do a PhD or when is the right time to your specialty training. It depends on what things have and the options that are available available at that time. Anything else you'd like to add or? Margarita, um, if you can jump in, we have a, a few more questions that have just come in. So if I uh, can re just read them out and maybe help out. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a question um, about um, doing a path of uh, a residency followed by three years at, uh, at NIH uh, and then starting a lab. Uh, is that pathway gone? Somebody has asked. Uh, so um, I presume that. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I think you can do a fellowship at NIH, and then uh, that is a very common path towards uh, independent investigation. Um, residency programs in, at NIH I'm not as familiar with, um, but certainly the fellowship programs are a great way to launch into a research career. And they too are designed to do some clinical, but basically to be in a lab and to, uh, uh, to extend your time um, for your uh, projects. Right. Um, I'm not sure, Margarita, if you can see the questions now, um, the other yes, ones, but um, I'm just... Okay. So, so we are... Go on. Sorry. Uh, shall we, I read the next question then? I don't think we have time to answer all of them because they just come up all together. Uh, but there is a question um, asking, what are the challenges and benefits to doing basic science research while also specializing in a procedural uh, heavy fields like gastroenterology or uh, obstetrics and gynecology, urology, et cetera. Uh, who would like to answer that question? <laughs> I, think we'll well, I think partly there might be some basic science issues that are gonna facilitate those. It may still be procedure based, but actually, for instance, there's some very important engineering that goes into that. So, so I, I, I mean, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier of trying to get a congruence between the research you're doing and, and the clinical field. I think the training can be a bit more challenging because of this time, if it's important that you get enough surgical time. Uh, but certainly um, in my department, I'm collaborating with surgeons at the moment. Um, in fact, some of those surgeons are doing very interesting genome-wide studies on populations of 500,000 and, and getting some very interesting outcomes that have translational potential. So you can absolutely do it, and there are examples of that. Um, and, you know, again, they're asking interesting questions that are inspired by their work with, with patients. So I definitely see there are advantages. I don't know if, if Claudia or Clifford have something to add to that. No, not really. Same answer. Just uh, pick your research carefully so that it fits what you're doing clinically. Mm. And I, I, I would agree, but I, I think that it does offer an advantage on the, in the long run. If you're doing some research at the same time you're practicing clinical medicine, the enjoyment factor goes way, way up. I think we've seen too many docs who only do practice, who get bored or tedious, or this becomes more job-like rather than the enjoyment of helping patients and also addressing and answering cl cr critical questions. So. So I think uh, you have a leg up on some people if you're able to be able to both do some research and also uh, practice clinical medicine. Actually, I would like to echo that. I really love my job. I love combining. Yeah, yeah. Work and yeah research. I, know, I think, me too. I mean, we've talked about some of the challenges today, but you know, I would like to say I think it's a. I am never bored. I do not ever have a boring yeah, day. Yeah, so yeah, I can yeah. recommend it as a as a career. I tremendously enjoyed it. Yeah, I think that's a closing remark, isn't it? <laughs> that <Right. laughs> it's a boring job. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think we don't have enough time for the last question, but we can answer it by Twitter or one of those uh, online uh, things. So right. just wanted to say thank you so, to all the speakers. Thank you to Eli for allowing us to have this webinar. And thank you for the audience for being um, uh, listening to us and making all these interesting questions.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you, Margarita. Bye-bye.